So I think a good place to start would be to know how you got involved in the Heller case or how you got involved in, the, in fighting for gun rights in, in the District of Columbia. Uh, it's a kind of a funny story because I had been involved in a case years earlier when I had used a handgun in self-defense. I was very happy I didn't have to discharge the weapon, but showing it was enough to uh, scare off a substantial gang of people who made it very clear where they were going to kill us. And I told that to a couple of people. And one of them, who knew someone, who knew someone, who knew someone, said, hey, there's this lawsuit. Are you interested? And I said, yeah, sure. But tell me more. And it turned out that the person organizing it worked in the same organization I worked in. It was a bit ironic. Uh, and so I joined them, and we met with the other plaintiffs and talked about our case and went forward and filed it. Well, it was while I was at Georgetown University um, in one of my government classes that um, an NRA representative was brought in to speak to the class. And it was there that I found out that it was illegal to own a handgun in D.C. And growing up as an army brat all over the country, I just assumed that that was the Second Amendment right we had all over the country. So I was really shocked um, that you didn't have that right in D.C. And it was at that point that I started researching the process of getting a gun, um, or what you, at the time, you could only get a long gun or a shotgun in D.C. And you had to keep it unloaded and um, bound with a trigger lock or in pieces all the time. You were never allowed to put it together. Um, and I was telling the story in 2002 at an Institute for Justice um, conference that my husband and I attended to you know, a group of people, like-minded people. And um, word got back through some people there to Bob Levy at the Cato Institute, you know, just telling my story. I, it took me two years, the process, to actually get my shotgun in D.C. Um, and he called me up in October of 2002 and said, hey, you know, we're thinking about fighting this. Would you be interested? And of course I was. And um, it was a long six-year process um, to get to the Supreme Court decision. Um, but uh, thankfully now I'm a handgun owner of actually a few handguns in D.C. And so after 2008, when you were finally able to legally register a handgun, what was that process like? Still not the easiest in the world. Um, there's a lot of fees involved, um, a lot of kind of hoops to go through. Um, now we've got an issue in D.C. with um, you have to have someone that uh, by federal law can accept the guns first. And the one person who was doing that, his name is Mr. Sykes, um, has um, lost his location where he did that. So. Um, it's another challenge just to get the gun shipped in and have someone re receive it. Um, so it's, it's still D.C. There's some, still some bureaucracy involved in it, but I have my handguns now, so I'm happy. The D.C. government relaxed its overt, astonishing hostility that they had evidence before, and they did implement some more reasonable procedures. Not enough. There's still only one registered firearms dealer in, who has a monopoly, uh, and that's not his fault, it's just that they're not issuing any others. And they're hoping someday he'll retire and it will be impossible to obtain a firearm. And that means that there needs to be more pressure because they are coming up with ways illegally to subvert what the court insisted on. It's very difficult to obtain a firearm, although it can be done. And then since the Heller case, in the last couple of years, you filed an additional lawsuit for the purposes of allowing you to carry a gun. That's right, so that we would be in accord with every other state in the country, and I mean every other jurisdiction in the United States, that allows people under one uh, regulated regime or another to be able to bear a firearm in self-defense. And the District of Columbia has a blanket ban on that, and we believe that that is uh, manifestly contrary to the uh, enumerated right in the Constitution. There's no justification for this. And indeed, last December, the uh, state of Illinois that had a similar blanket ban, that was struck down by the Court of Appeals in that state. The D.C. government put great emphasis on, well, Illinois has that. Now that's gone, clearly grossly unconstitutional. And the state legislature has since passed a law that establishes procedures for persons to be able to carry firearms uh, lawfully in the state. And I do believe that our Second Amendment rights include the right to um, conceal carry and be able to defend yourself outside the home. And that's actually where a lot of the risk occurs, especially in D.C., no matter what neighborhood you're in. Um, 
you know, you can be walking around in daylight and there will be someone who, you know, jumps out of a car and they're, they're having, you know, they'll be holding on to an illegal handgun, but then the law abiding tax paying citizens like myself, we can't defend ourselves. And as, as a female walking around, you know, you can really be preyed upon. So I, I would love to be able to defend myself outside my home too. At times I have been assaulted in the District of Columbia. I've had people break into my home into, in the District of Columbia. Uh, we have seen a general decline in violent crimes in D.C., which I'm very grateful for. Uh, but I think that people have the right to defend themselves in their homes, but also out on the street. It's kind of rare for females who live in the city to, to actually have my political beliefs at all or to be a gun owner. But what I found really shocking was getting involved in this case is rather than having people harassing me for being involved in the case, I was actually getting strangers calling me up and saying thank you. Um, so I, I really didn't get any bad feedback. And even for people who disagree with me politically and they may be very liberal, they, they really did feel that you should have a right in your own home to have a gun. And I also found that there were a lot of people who kind of were uh, closet gun owners, where it was unpopular to say it, but when push comes to shove, they come out with the truth, yeah, I've got one under my bed. What the Heller case did was to crystallize an emerging consensus among constitutional scholars. Because even many scholars who you would have expected to be hostile to the Second Amendment had begun to come out saying, you know, it's a little embarrassing for us perhaps, but it is an individual right that is enumerated and protected in the Constitution. And if you don't like it, you have to amend the Constitution.